and welcome to a brand new episode of Straight Up Show Podcast. I am your host, Calvin, riding solo today uh, because this is a, this, today's episode is going to be very personal, uh, very near and dear to me that uh, our guest today um, is someone that I love truly and dearly. Uh, and so I thought this episode would be more impactful if it's just uh, she and I talk about this. Uh, this person today has, I, I've, I consider her a global ambassador uh, for her country because she's done great things. Uh, and, and before I get started, if you've been living under a rock since February, there's a lot going on. And I think that if you listen to our podcast previously, uh, I've foreshadowed some of the stuff that goes on. I think it happened around February uh, 24th, maybe that, uh, that the world kind of stopped and where Russia began to invade uh, Ukraine. And if you watch our show or listen uh, to our show, if you're a podcaster, uh, you know that we've been running PSAs about supporting Ukraine and with their efforts that going with the invasion of Russia. Uh, countless people have died, uh, families separated. There's so much going on with this count, this, this senseless act of terrorism. And I don't care what side of the fence you are, uh, it is indeed terrorism. Uh, so much so that people have lost their lives once again, uh, people have lost their homes. Uh, and cities, beautiful, beautiful cities bombed. And all because one person wants to take control. Uh, previously on our episodes, we had uh, a foreign exchange student of ours uh, that stayed with my family for a year. And it was a learning experience, not only from her, but to us as well, not only as Black Americans, but Americans as well, because you know, simple things like uh, hearing about the country, the, the country, city of Kiev, and uh, things like eating different U Ukrainian dishes. But the young lady that came to our lives showed us more than just about Ukraine, like things like the Ukraine. Why there's a great significant why you shouldn't say the in the beginning of Ukraine. And this young lady has blossomed into someone that I now consider a hero. Our guest today is, I call her my sister, and the fact that I have her on the show today means a lot because I know that she's safe. So uh, without further ado, without wasting any more time, our guest today is the lovely and talented, heroic Julia Timoshenko. Thank you so much for coming on our show today. Hi, thank you so much for having me and for such kind words. I'm definitely not a hero, but I appreciate it. Yes, not what you are to me because uh, you and I have a unique relationship. And uh, I really, those last two months that you were in uh, our, our home and stuff like that, it really meant a lot to me because you, we went through some, I guess, life-changing experiences to where like, I, I, I taught her how to drive and I didn't know that was illegal for international uh, rules and stuff like that. At the time, I didn't know that. I, I wasn't supposed to do that. But uh, but I really wanted you to have that American high school uh, teenager experience. And uh, but you know, you see a lot of kids come around and a lot of students, and especially where we're at, where we come from in Louisiana, to where they just grow up and they just kind of slack off a little bit. And I think that since you left our home, you've been on a skyrocket. You've been moving, doing phenomenal things. And as your brother, as somebody that mentored you or watched over you, I am damn proud of the person and the woman that you have become. So I just want to say when I heard about these things, my heart dropped. And I've never been so sad in my life to hear that I could possibly lose somebody like you. So uh, thank you for just answering my phone call and telling me that you're okay because you had me worry for a second. And just to see it ground zero of what you were going through, that shit scared me. I'm not going to lie. And I just want to say that I love you and I'm glad that you're okay. Sorry. <laughs> but I'm glad that you're okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for saying that. It, it means a lot. It, yeah. I knew that there were going to be lots of people worried about me, but I didn't realize how many. And yeah, you guys have been supporting and you know like texting and messaging us all the time which means a lot truly yeah i try to try to take a step back because i don't want to be like all in your face like 
because I know people are hitting you up left and right. So uh, just the fact that if I can see you post on Instagram, that makes me feel okay. And there were a couple of days that you didn't post. And I was like, man, like, don't, don't scare me like that. And like, I think with you and I, I think we, we both like to channel what we see our experience and like, we like to broadcast and show it. And so, uh, you know, I think as somebody that works in media, I think that you should maybe join journalism, just saying, like, I think you should maybe get into the business, but uh, thank you for keeping everybody updated with what's going on. I think that, Julia, you have a raw truth to you. You don't sugarcoat stuff. You make sure that what people see, it's pure and it's truthful. And I think that we need more people like you because even with this whole Ukraine thing going on with Russia, there have been people taking advantage of the situation and making it bigger than what it is, or not bigger, but making it make false narratives about what's going on in Ukraine. Yeah. And you've been doing a great job of clarifying things, right? Uh, so when I, when I couldn't reach Julia, my second option was to reach her mom. Yeah. <laughs> and, and text, text her through Google Translate. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's the the we I don't speak any Ukrainian at all, and her mom doesn't speak much English, but we talk every day. And so thank God for Google to help me translate some things that I'm pretty sure is not translating the right way. But we've gotten sometimes, out. Of the- sometimes it's so it's so it's so funny how it sounds. But yeah, but like the message gets across. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the most important. Yeah, she was there for me and she kept me updated. Um, so let's get right into it, Julia. Um, you know, we we talked about how in February, uh, Russia decided to start invading Ukraine. Uh, can you take it from there? What exactly is going on, and what happened at this time? Oh gosh, it's so hard to go back to that date that, because it's like that's, it's it's such a such a wild moment. I mean, uh, there's obviously like the global news about it that I guess like everybody can go and read on the internet, but like I can kind of retell it from my perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, I I mean I think like there's there's many steps you can back uh, you can take back. Uh, before that when uh, there were many alarms about the possibility of the invasion uh, that were often ignored Um, you can take them back to like the previous year but you can also take them eight years back when the first invasion started in 2014 and russia invaded ukraine for the first time and annexed crimea and invaded the east Uh, that was kind of brushed off and ignored you can take it you know, 50, 70 years during like years of Stalin when Stalin was basically starving Ukraine, how that is still the same method. A lot of the times you can take it still like more like 200 years back when uh, Russia was like oppressing Ukrainian independence movements and killing people basically for just trying to organize and self in kind of like self-determination movement for Ukrainian independence. So I think like this is the first kind of thing that you need to understand that when for the world that was such a huge like shocker, like how can you have like a full on war, like a middle ages, previous century type of war in like 21st century in the middle of Europe. Um, I think a lot of those people can live conveniently lived before February 24, just completely ignoring the history, the true history of Eastern Europe and what Russia has been for Eastern Europe and other parts of the world, including Asia, uh, for centuries. And I think for a lot of Ukrainians and other nations that have been occupied by Russia before, um, it was very clear. So. Um, like I remember posting something on February 24th, like that I don't remember in my memory when I realized that Russia is this huge threat threat to existence of my country and my own life, because it kind of feels like it's always been in my memory. Like I was born with it just because of the kind of stories that I was told by my family 
about uh, the Holodomor, which is the genocide of Ukrainians that were artificially orchestrated by Stalin in, in the early 30s, uh, because basically he wanted to repress them um, and kind of like eliminate any idea of like Ukrainian cultural identity, which was mainly preserved among the peasants, among kind of like the rural population. Um, the personal stories I had in my family about that were like very shocking. Uh, then like all the other stories about the repression of language, of culture, or of like forced collectivization um, and etc. I kind of always knew that that was just like Moscow and whoever was sitting there, whether it's like Stalin, Putin, other people, like that that was pure evil. And I could never trust that. And like, and I think like this is a very important background because just to remembering February 24th is like always very just shocking for me because like it feels now at this point like a dream um I was sleeping in this bed that I'm sitting in right now I'm really lucky to be able to return to my apartment in Kiev um but I went to sleep already with um a lot of anxiety and I've been having that anxiety for a month before the war because that's when I kind of started posting on Instagram and talking a lot about um, something that I personally felt like was missing from the Western coverage of the war in Ukraine, which is oftentimes is kind of like co co connecting the pieces in history and explaining how is this nothing new. A lot of the times people just talked about either like recent years or like the war in Ukraine from 2014, as if it's some like new sort of development but they always miss the big historical picture how this struggle and fight of independence for Ukraine has been going on for literally centuries, in which is wild concept, but it's still going on in the 21st century, not even like in like a cultural political space, but in very barbaric physical warfare. And um, I always wanted like a lot of foreigners to know that, like, to know that and see the role of Russian culture, of Russian literature, of Russian um, kind of cultural dominance and like narratives and propaganda that's being spread around the world. Um, the role of that in the events that are happening today in my country, um, because a lot of people like either like refusing to see that or it's just like too complicated for them to learn. So um, I've been talking about that, about the possibility of the war and about how it connects to, like, to this idea that Russia as a country, not in only Putin, but also like a large population of it, are convinced that we are the same kind of people. Uh, hence, we belong to them. Hence, like our land belongs to them. And hence, it's OK to come to our home and just, you know, take us back, even though we we don't want it. And we've always been saying that we have our own strong national identity. Um, so on the, I went to sleep on February 23rd. It was actually, no, it was already 24th because I just like, I couldn't fall asleep until 3 a.m. approximately. Had a lot of anxiety, but I've been having it literally every night. Like I couldn't fall asleep until three for like three weeks or so because of so much news and something going on now reflecting back I feel like I felt it on like a subconscious level that something's going to happen like I felt it but um, I was refusing to kind of rationalize it in my head um, it's like the talks have been about that every day in my work like people started uh, packing emergency bags people started checking like bomb shelters in their houses and etc so Kind of rationally, I was trying to reject that idea and be like, no, this is this is very extreme. Um, it's not gonna go that far. But like I think somewhere, somewhere in me, something like was telling me, like, no, this is like this is gonna be real. <laughs> and I was going to sleep when already uh I was actually chatting with uh, one of my close American friends who is my classmate from the university. And because I was going to sleep, but it was still a day for him. Uh, the last thing I saw was actually Secretary Blinken saying on like some sort of platform on Twitter, I don't know, that Russians are going to invade by by the morning. 
and I was like what? like I literally asked my friend like, like what is he saying like this is this is just like like why is he giving me more of this anxiety because I thought that those were just like scary statements made by big politicians like I didn't I refused to believe it and in like in my friend also replies like kind of like laughing he's like ha 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 yeah I don't know what the U.S. government is doing why are they giving this like anxiety to Ukrainians um and yeah like I I go to sleep sleep for two hours because at 5 a.m like almost like equal like almost like sharp 5 a.m I just like open my eyes in this room um and I don't understand why I have been woken up um I just I just like look at my phone that starts buzzing um and that's and I receive messages from the same friend that says god I hope you're safe and I'm like why are you saying that and then I hear the first explosion and I realize oh like the explosion doesn't sound like a firework then I hear another one and like you hear them like you realize like how somehow I was able to identify that they're coming from different directions and, and different like distances some of them are like close some of them are far now I, I know like all of the locations that they were targeting that morning um but like my friend is the first one like I'm asking him I was like I'm not able to understand like what is happening can you and he started sending me because there was no like even big media yet. I think like media obviously in the West, like Ukrainians were sleeping. So like it took, I think approximately 30 minutes to like Ukrainian media start reporting, kind of like announcing that the war started because I think like everybody had like just a state of shock. Um, and, um, but like Americans and the other like big media outlets, there was, they started reporting, but my friend started send, sending me tweets like showing how uh, the sky is closed up about Ukraine for commercial flights, um, showing how uh, the last kind of like um, camera footage from the border guards on, on Belarus border where they like running away, um, uh, showing me some other tweets about like the movement of Russian um, military and it's been tracked by independent intelligence sources uh, that like it started in into Ukraine and I'm getting that information but I'm also like and I, I I'm I fully like my first thoughts are like no 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 this is this is not real like this is some sort of misinformation this might be just like somebody just saying like you know exaggerating things but at the same time I start hearing like one explosion after the other and then I hear a sound of fighter jet flying about me and the reason, like, and like, it's something that is actually connects to, to my um, exchange year in Bozier. The reason why I knew perfectly what fighter jets sound like because of Barksdale. Barksdale, yeah. And because of their shows, like, they're like, I remember being like, like, that's the memory. Like, I remember being at the airline uh, high school and them doing their like runs around. And I remember being like, oh my gosh, the sound is just like so scary. Like I would have like, because it, it does sound like something you hear in the movies. And that was like the first time I heard it like in real life. But then this time I'm sitting in my room and I'm realizing I don't even know whose fighter jet is it. What if it, what is if it, if it's like Russian? Now I know that it was Ukrainian fighter jets flying. Um, but back then when you like don't, re like you, you can't check even if it's like ours or not, you don't know what's going on. And like, I needed to talk to someone. So like my friend was the first person I called just so I can like voice it out and crystallize in my mind that, okay, like this is, it, this is starting. And he like, he very calmly talked to me, like, you need to start packing. You need to start, you know, just like taking like things that you only think that are like necessary, like documents, like some clothes and food. Um, and I think for the next like an hour and a half, I was just like running in panic because I was constantly checking like online, like social media or like news and trying to pack, but I literally just like couldn't think straight. It was so hard. Like it was the most basic stuff that I needed to to pack yet. Like I couldn't. Um, and then around, I think 7 a.m. when it already started being like bright outside, um, I went out to get some groceries because I think like that's something that COVID actually taught me. Like I realized that there's gonna be a huge rush now for like 
groceries and all the other things and like water. Um, there was a huge rush for cash, but none of the cash machines were working back then because there, there, there was like a fear that um, basically entire digital infrastructure is going to collapse. So you won't be able to pay by card or um, you won't be able to like, yeah, uh, cash money if the machine's going to be broken. Uh, but basically all cash was gone and withdrawn. Um, so yeah, and like really, I remember just like walking on the street and you can see just people with suitcases leaving, like everybody's leaving, just like everybody's moving somewhere. Like I like it did feel like complete apocalyptic movie. Like if I had to imagine how it is, like this is this is how it felt because everybody is just completely shocked. Um, you see like some stores didn't even open. I assume that they're like workers just didn't come. Some stores did open and like, I admire those people a lot who just, you know, Russia is bombing our cities. They, they just woke up and went to their job as a cashier at the store. Um, that was actually my parents. Like my mom was like, I, I mean, I talked to them as well and called them. And we had that conversation when I like, we were like, okay, like yes, this is started. And uh, my mom's like, yeah, I'm just gonna go to work. I'm like, what do you mean you're gonna go to work? Um, and the same with my dad. The next day on February 25th, he went to work. Uh, but yeah, like it, it's shocking because yeah, people started preparing the bomb shelters. We were walking around. We were like trying to think what to take with us to the bomb shelter because it was very cold back then as well. Like, it was still February, like very cold winter. Um, it is. Some, yeah, like it, it's shocking, but I think like what connects to um, something that I was saying at the beginning of this like historic fight that has been going on. Um, I think around noon on February 24th, like I was still here in Kiev in my, my apartment. I read the news that uh, the Belarus border was completely like breached and broke off from the, their side and that the Russian tanks are currently on their way to Kyiv. And um, just overall experience of like having to, to comprehend that you're sitting in an apartment of a very modern, you know, European city where like you've known it as like a very peaceful, fun place. You're sitting there as, a, as like the another country's tanks are marching to take it. Just like that, 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 that just whole thought really like sunk inside me. Um, but the next one that followed after that was me realizing that I as a Ukrainian, but also like all Ukrainians, we haven't had a generation that hasn't suffered from Russia. Like I could be that generation because I didn't have to live through Soviet Union, like my parents, for example. I was already born in independent Ukraine that still has its own problems and obviously not a perfect country, but it's just such, it's a, it's a country that I'm really, really proud of on like so many levels. But realizing that I could be that generation, but no, my life is ruined and something that my ancestors were fighting against that I that I wouldn't have to experience, I'm experiencing right now as I'm sitting here. And it literally felt as if like the pain of all generations, like my grandparents, my great grandparents, like, and further on, like, I really felt, I think the pain of all of them in that moment and in that day, because I, I didn't think I've ever had such a like hysterical breakdown. I just like that thought made me like collapse on like a corridor floor in my apartment and just cry for like 30 minutes. And it is something very personal for me that I have. Like people had very different reactions. Some people had like very strong like coping mechanisms when they were like they were shockingly calm the first day, like for example, my mom. But I was just a complete mess because I think like I was going through all of these thoughts that were uniting like the past of my family members, like my, my family history, the just how much my people have already suffered and like realization how much we're yet are gonna suffer because of stupid Russia. Yeah, that was a lot, sorry. No, no, it's fun. And I love, I love that, that you told me that. And it, someone who as strong as you 
I would never think that you would get scared about anything because like you came to America as a teenager by yourself. And a lot of people don't understand how, how, how brave you have to be to come to somewhere you don't know and just stay there for a year. So I thought that you could, somebody like you can just overcome that. So to hear that you were scared, that kind of makes me feel like, wow, that it was, it was really that serious. One thing that you mentioned and that I know personally is that when all this was going on, everybody, everyone was evacuating and, uh, I, and you, you were right. Your mom was just like fearless, just didn't like, I'm like, Hey, are you okay? Oh, I'm going to work. I'm like, wait, what? Like she is very fearless and your parents are fearless. And how was that doing? Because one thing that made me happy to know that you were able to reunite with your mom and your grandma, uh, what was that experience like? And because not both your parents came, uh, what was it all about? And what was being in a bomb shelter uh, like at that experience? I mean, like I, so we left Kyiv on the second day of the war on February 25th. Uh, and it was a good call because, um, I mean, initially my dad was saying that if it's too bad, you need to just come to our village outside of Kiev towards the east called Zavorichi. Um, and I had a very bad feeling about it because it's on the eastern side and it's closer to, it's not close, but it's still like closer towards the Russian border with Ukraine. And I told my dad, like, I have a feeling like they're going to be there, like, in, like, soon. And he said, yeah, you're right, they might. Um, so the only, like, the, the, the best way to, like, leave was, like, to the, towards the western side of Ukraine that doesn't border with Russia. Um, and um, we didn't know when to make that call of judgment. And, but we realized that there was, there could be a moment when, when it could be too late, like we couldn't get out of from the city because it could have been encircled and besieged. Um, there could be like other things like the roads are completely destroyed from bombings or like the train tracks completely destroyed from bombings. So many things. So like you never know. And it's like different sources are telling you different things. Some people saying that it's too dangerous to try to travel, that you need to sit inside your apartment. Other people saying that it's too dangerous to stay. Uh, because you never know like what's going to happen with the city if they're going to take it. I mean, like if Russian to the Russians took Kiev, like that would have been like a completely different way of this history. But um, so it was really hard because also I think like the understanding of the fact that you might leave right now with the tiny suitcase of just essentials, and you don't know whether you're going to come back because coming back is not guaranteed. You don't know if like your apartment is going to be bombed. Um, and everything you know like is going to be destroyed so it is such a difficult decision like probably like one of the most difficult decisions in my life um, I did have a conversation um, a month before the war with my dad specifically because I was in my family the only one who like was feeling something is coming so I actually started asking my family members do we have a, an ev evacuation plan do we know what we do like is there a way of like if we lose connection I mean because you never you never get like a crash course on how to act in a war or like what happens in the war like as, and because especially to this extent because there there hasn't been like a war like that in the 21st century yet and i hope like this is the last one and i hope that this one is going to end with ukraine's victory and you know and then we're going to just make russia pay reparations but but still like there's going to be just a lot of things but you never know how to act, what to do. Like, yes, there are some kind of like manuals and general information for the public. But for example, we were really scared that we might lose cell phone connection because it is technically very easy for them to bomb cell phone towers or like to take the connection away or just block it in some other way. Um, that didn't happen. And that was really shocking. I think like three days into the war and like everything, Kind of works like we have electricity we have water um we have like cell phone connection like the banks are working like yeah they had like a few glitches but those glitches are not really different from like anything that could be wrong on like a normal day like technically um and i was like wow this is impressive like i thought that those were the first thing that are going to be like gone 
like, no, like Ukraine's infrastructure and just like system somehow functioned almost like flawlessly. And it's actually something that like, I feel like the Russians themselves are like shocked because I think at the beginning there were like discussions like why can't we just like take off their like communication? Why can't we just like take it away? Um, but I guess we're just good at it. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, like you don't know like what's gonna happen. So um, it's really difficult. But a month before the war, I had the conversation with my dad um, where I asked him, uh, are you gonna leave as well? And he said, no. Uh, if the war starts, I'm going to be here in Zaborich in our house, in like the house that I, where I grew up. Um, and he said back then, something that I thought was like a joke. He said, like, if they come here, uh, I will die, but I will take at least six Russians with me. Like he, because he has a hunting gun, like a rifle. So he was joking about how he's just going to shoot a few and that's it. And, and but, it, but it's crazy that he said that, but like little do people know that that's the mentality of ukrainians like they have and case in point before we go to break right quick like i, I want to say this the fact that your dad said that that speaks volumes of how ukrainians have handled the situation and we're going to talk more with julia timoshenko on the other side of the break make sure you stay tuned this is straight up show podcast the videos and images displayed all across the world cannot fully express what the people of Ukraine are going through. This senseless act of terrorism has cost many of their lives and forced millions of Ukrainians out of their homes. Yet it's the Ukrainians' pride and resiliency that has inspired the entire world. So we here at Straight Up ask you to stand for freedom, stand for human rights, but most importantly, join us as we stand with Ukraine. In the two years that Straight Up has been a podcast, we've gone to where most podcasts have never gone before. From multiple celebrity guests to groundbreaking episodes, Straight Up is changing the podcast game. And now that season six is finally here, we plan to continue leveling up with our exclusive season six merchandise. That's right. Grab your 80s retro inspired merch today. Just visit our website at straightupshowpodcast.com. That's S-T-R number eight upshowpodcast.com. Shirts as low as $19.99. All right, welcome back to the Australia Show podcast. We are talking all things right now about the Ukrainian war with Russia, or war, uh, the war Ukrainians are facing with Russia uh, right now. We have uh, my sister. Uh, I call her a hero. She says she's not a hero, but uh, in my eyes, you are a hero. You are def- definitely uh, patriotic uh, to your country. Uh, and it shows to all of her social media work. So Julia, uh, thank you so much once again for uh, taking your time out, uh, and you know, I'm glad to tell us that you're safe right now. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, before we went to break, we were talking about your dad, and he said that he wasn't going anywhere, and he had his hunting rifle. He says they killed me. Uh, they, I'm gonna take six Russians with me. Uh, that attitude, and I think that I talked about this previously on a previous podcast a couple of weeks ago. That that mentality of Ukrainians is what the world's seeing, because you you all have probably been counted out by different countries that you all would have been uh, fallen by now. But here it is in August as of this recording. Uh, and this started in February. And Ukraine is, if you can see right now on the YouTube or the TV version of this, Julia is sitting nicely in her apartment right now. Yeah. Like they did not back down. Uh, they are holding strong. But people like your dad and definitely a global hero and Vladimir Zelensky, uh, like that's what you want to see. That's what you want to hear. And I think that they put a lot of American politicians to shame because a lot of people won't go to the front line and say, hey, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. And if you want this, you're going to have to kill me. And it's so 
heroic to see people like your dad and your president to do this. And I think that gave me hope that your country is going to be okay. And, and I mean, what do you think about all that? Just that you see your, your, your brethren and, and your fellow countrymen just saying, you know what, we're here. We're not going anywhere. I think it's like, it's so incredibly yeah, like inspiring and um, just motivating like to see Ukraine um, like that because for the first month and I think like this is something unique and something that we definitely have to experience and I I met a lot of Americans and foreigners who came to Ukraine at that time um, to like do aid and humanitarian work and etc. I met also some uh, people who came to join the International Legion and that's like a whole different topic about like foreigners coming and fighting for Ukraine. Like, like those people are heroes to me as well. And like, we are incredibly grateful. Um, but I think something that you had to be in Ukraine to experience, because this is nothing like you can ever, like this is truly like historic. Everybody was doing something. Like people literally couldn't just sit on the couch and do nothing and, or like rest or chill or sleep or something like, everybody like people like obviously there, there were like the first ones who had joined the army and you know medics and you know kind of like the first class of people that are the most useful um like those who are starting like started accepting refugees making shelters and stuff but then there is like a whole array of other people there are people who are like programmers and coders who are like trying to hack russian sites there were like for example people who are good at like online Google ads or like Facebook ads, they were like running ads on Russian people to like inform Russian people about the wars and the crimes that are happening in Ukraine. There were people who were like cooking for the military or like for the refugees, oh, sorry, not refugees, internally displaced people because if they're in Ukraine, they're still internally displaced. So like cooking like stuff for the military or, or the people who lost their homes or had to flee, there were people who were like accepting uh, Ukrainians to their like houses. Um, like I was also like joining the initiative to, to um, make um, camouflage nets because there was such a huge need for like camouflage nets like so like young schools from like middle school and high school were like making do those like in, uh, camouflage nets um, there were people who were like I don't know um, were creating like art posters and things to like spread so people like, can go and protest for like abroad um, so it, it's literally something that like I had a friend who like who was very kind. His family actually um, uh, took uh, me and my mom and my friends to their home, like in the western part of Ukraine. My dad and my grandparents stayed in my village in the Kiev region. Um, so that friend, he literally he brought us, and I'm like, I thought like we can sit down, chill, and just like talk about like what's happening. And he's like, no, 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 like I gotta run. I have a car, which means I'm useful. I'm gonna go see what I can like transport, if I can transport people, if I can like transport food or other stuff or medicine. So he was, and I literally didn't see him for days because he was just running around and like. There wasn't a moment when you just like sit down and it's just like so inspiring because the entire country felt so united as like you've never seen before but at the same time like like nobody told us how to do it people themselves like, like decided to do this and it was just shocking that 100 percent of ukrainians just were doing something to help um the war effort and even if they're like they couldn't they were just like taking care of themselves so they could be safe which is also helping you know um and um countries like you know the us or you know western europe um, other countries which have the privilege of now having a few generations that haven't experienced war directly and I know that America has been taking parts in some wars, for example, um, in like Vietnam or other places, but still you never had war on your own soil. You never had it on your in your own like homeland. Like, yes, like, there is a percentage of people who have been suffering and experiencing in, in your society, but it's never to the same extent as like we as Ukrainians to like 100% of people are impacted of the, by this. 
um, I think like it's really difficult for them to understand what it's like and how the nation can just like get united so much. Cause like whenever people, like, I, I remember like even uh, seeing that in the US, even on those like late night shows, like people were talking about like small heroic acts of Ukrainians, like a grandma uh, shooting down like a Russian drone with like a pickle jar. And people were like, no, 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 like that, that must be like made up thing. Like that sounds just like too much, like a TV show thing. You don't understand how literally a grandma in the village would make poisonous like pancakes for Russians. Just, just you know, like in a as a badass woman, like she would do that because she knows that she's helping Ukraine or how like people in the villages who are like, under Ukraine, but had the Ukrainian soldiers because they were like fighting, like they were feeding Ukrainian, like they didn't have food, much food left for themselves, but they were like, no, 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 like take it, like you're the soldiers, you need to eat it right now. Like, like people were like, no, 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 this is stage. Like, no, you don't understand. We don't live in the society where we need to stage some things when, when you need to like create some fake narrative. Yes, it sounds for you too, too good to be true or too terrible to be true on the other side about like Russian crimes. But this is our reality and something that we know that our grandparents, great grandparents have already experienced it. And we know the consequences of our country not being able to stand up and, you know, falling under Russia. And we clearly don't want it. So, yes, we're going to do everything that we can even if it's like the smallest, the most like ridiculous thing uh, to fight. And yeah, like, I think like people who are, were not in Ukraine at the time would never understand that, would never like understand what it's like to experience this kind of unification in the name of the victory of your country. Um, so I'm really proud like personally, like to be Ukrainian and to know that I'm part of that collective nation. Yeah, and that's one thing I, I've always noticed about you. Like, even when you were in America, you, you, even before all this started, you were proud, proud, proud of your country. And like, anytime I said the Ukraine boy, I, I you would be on me, you know. And so just to see that pride and see that what you represented years ago before all this, it really meant something. So, and that scares me because I feel like sometimes that, like here as an American, if we were faced with that. And what's going on right now, people are so divided. Like, what would happen if this was, in, in fact, on our own soil? What, what, what would happen? Because we're so divided right now, especially right now. And it's crazy that those kind of narratives come back to Ukraine, especially what you're going through. And even right now, uh, America is helping out with Ukraine. And there has been some backlash about uh, our president helping out with the weaponry. Uh, and people saying that we shouldn't help. Uh, when you hear things like this and these negative narratives about uh, your country, like how do you take that and why should people actually care in, in your mind? I mean, first of all, it really personally hurts me. Um, like, pers like I, I, it's really difficult. If before I could like engage in some sort of, sort of like intellectual discussion debate, you know, talk to these kinds of people. Like right now, I just don't have the energy. Like it, it has been sucked out of me by everything that I've been through in the last um, like few months. And I just don't even, yeah, have the ability to engage as much. But I think there's two kinds of things. Like if you're just against sending sending money like first of all you need to understand nobody's sending cash to ukraine you're sending us weapons yes that cost money but sometimes i feel like some people don't even understand they think they think that those money are coming into like in cash to the pocket of zelensky and i'm like it's military aid that's not how it works you send us very expensive weapons that's why it's like sounds like a lot of money but actually something that could be like billions of dollars could be like a few machines like you know because military shit is like very expensive um so i mean obviously i think like i gotta say that we as ukrainians are incredibly grateful for every single thing um 
I think like something that we've been saying that this should have been done earlier and there's like a lot of like bureaucracy involved in how like those get delivered and like how many things need to be signed, signed approved by Congress. I understand that it's important like legislatively and there is a procedures, but people need to understand the longer it takes, the more people are going to die in us. So like when we say that we need it faster, it's not because we're being like spoiled brats. It's because it's literally our life depends on it. So uh, as a Ukrainian, sometimes like I don't see the need in these like bureaucratic things that are happening behind the scenes in making that happen. Uh, but obviously I'm still very, very grateful for everything that's coming in and that everything that US is giving us. And I think it is a historic level of support and Ukrainians will surely never forget that if before a lot of Ukrainians were like obsessed with the US and the idea of it, um, like right now they, they're even more because they feel that like solidarity and support. So that is important. Like the first thing that I was referring to, like when people are against that, uh, I see like kind of like two kinds of people. First, people just like purely against that because it's their tax money. They don't want to send it overseas. Um, and that is exactly like also like a very false thing because the US has a lot of military equipment. Whether you send it to Ukraine or not, it's still gonna spend, be spent and be sitting in the US as like military equipment. It's not like those money are gonna be transferred to like something else like healthcare immediately just because US doesn't do it. Like US always has just impressive arsenal military. That's its huge strength. Whether you like it or not, it's just gonna probably keep being like that for for like some time, especially now with like a huge war in, in Europe. So, um, and when you just talk about it, like from kind of like a perspective of kind of greed of like, oh, I don't wanna share my tax money. Just like imagine, like you talk so much about like Holocaust and genocides and like, you know, how that is was like such a dark part of history. Well. Whether you want to accept it or not, this is something that we are going through in Ukraine right now. Like everything, like I feel like I'm reliving the World War III, except I have internet. That's the only difference. But the things that I was doing, the th like the way I was fleeing from Kiev, the way I was like leaving my stuff behind when my family was under occupation, when my like I only could message my dad and like SMS, and he was telling me how like he literally saw like um, Russian tanks on the street nearby running like this is ex like when i hear about stories in villages nearby of like girls being raped by russians and thinking that i could be in that village um you can't tell me that this is not you know the same that was happening during the holocaust and like nazi germany occupying all these countries you you just don't have a right sitting somewhere on like a couch in the us um you can't argue with me about that some people try and i'm just like no like i I'm just like, no, like I, can't, I can't let you do that just because you don't have a right to even like open your mouth about that. It might sound rude, but like, just imagine my experience being for even like a, a fraction of it. Um, and imagine that in the World War III, you had an ability to stop like Nazi Germany. You, you had an ability to save thousands of lives you, you had an ability to stop Nazi Germany from moving further, further and like letting those countries defend themselves and doing it quicker, like being kind of proactive rather than reactive. You didn't have to see like the gas chambers and people, you know, dying in the most cruel of death um, because you could have helped earlier and you could have stepped in. Would you really regret those like fractional taxed money just because they went on saving so many lives and preventing like just like genocide like don't you feel like i think like it's actually should feel like really empowering because like you as a nation actually have like a full opportunity to be on the right side of history and to support a very just cause in does how much does it take away from you realistically like is it going to be such a like life changing thing for you if like those I don't know, jets from US, like fighter jets are going to Ukraine right now, where are they going to be put in like probably better use than standing in like an air base in the US? Um, I understand that there's a lot of things that you want to debate and discuss from different angles, but this is kind of like how we see this. And so I don't understand this kind of argument of 
you know, oh, we just don't want to send money because it's like our money. Uh, the second one is what I'm seeing is like more kind of like people on the left side um, in the US saying, well, more weapons mean more war. And that's like a completely false logic as well, because Ukraine is not trying to like invade anybody. We're just defending ourselves. We just want to take our like our territories back, like deoccupy what's being occupied and liberated. And when people saying like, oh no, Ukraine can't win, they just gonna fight and like more people are gonna die. Like, no, this is stupid again, because like I'm now my village, my hometown, the place where I grew up my entire life, um, where my family still is, it was occupied for a month. And then the Russians left, as people like to say. But you know why they left? Because Ukrainians kicked their asses. Because they couldn't take Kyiv, because there was a huge resistance, because there were weapons that were destroying their tanks. Like I saw their destroyed equipment with my own eyes. Mm. And that's why they left. And guess what? Right now, there is nobody's dying in my village. People are happy. People are coming back to life. People are returning and doing things that they're like love. Uh, and I can see actually war kind of like, you know, fading into the history of it. Like, obviously, it's still like on people's minds. But when people tell me like, oh, no, like weapons won't make a difference. They will just prolong like suffering. Like this is just, again, such a stupid argument because it comes from people who never had to be in war zone and, or see war with their own with their own eyes so saying things like no we just need to call for peace and diplomacy it's a very privileged position because russia doesn't respect diplomacy they don't care about agreements they don't care about anything they just understand force and that's that force that they have seen in like northern parts of Kiev that has been liberated and they're seeing other parts like in the south of ukraine right now this is the only way to help Ukraine is by making it more strong on like military side, because this is ultimately, which is gonna like decide how many more people are gonna suffer or and when this will stop or not. So if you don't wanna send weapons just for that, well, if you like what, like then Russia is gonna just like occupy these territories and like move forward and take more of Ukraine and you think they're gonna stop there? Like, no, they're gonna like, come back years after because they invaded us in 2014 we told you that this is bad this is gonna get worse we got ignored and then on february 24th everybody was suddenly shocked and ukrainians were like why are you shocked like we've been telling this to you since literally eight years ago so the idea of like oh no let's give russia some land now I mean, first of all, you don't even like want to know what's happening in that land. Like the, the way they're prosecuting Ukrainians right now, like I'm pretty sure like I would get killed like immediately if I were in the occupied territory, if I, God forbid, somehow like happened to be there. Because like, like I'm pretty sure I'm on the list of Russia already for like my activism and specifically for my ties with the US, like 100%. So like do you think me living under occupation is something that like always is better like there are like hundreds and thousands of people like me as well like are right now they're trying to somehow escape or who still have their families in the occupied territories and for ukrainians i think it's a very clear kind of like learning point from history that it's better for us to like almost like die than live under russian occupation and i think people don't get that like people don't get how serious it is. It's not something that we've learned today. It's something that our grandparents and grand great grandparents have been telling and experiencing before. So yeah, the idea of like let's let's stop the war and just bring peace, like no weapons. Russia just takes some territories and gets happy. Like, no, that doesn't exist. It's some utopia that you made it in your mind because you don't want to face the harsh reality of this. And the harsh reality that like, yes, we need to fight and help Ukraine to become stronger on the military front. Uh, and yes, there are gonna be more battles where lots of Ukrainians are gonna die, mostly soldiers, because they are ready to put up their life for liberty. Um, and you thinking like, and that's the difference as well. Like Americans don't understand, like whether you give us weapons or not, Ukrainians still gonna fight. 
like Ukrainians, like Ukrainian soldiers, you, like they gotta do it with their bare hands because that's what we've seen. Uh, you giving weapons is preventing them from dying, like more of them. I've, I actually read it somewhere in New York Times. Like somebody made the statement saying like, oh no, US giving more, more weapons is gonna lead to more Ukrainian soldiers dying. And I'm like, are you dumb? How is that making any sense? Because the more weapons you give to Ukrainian soldiers, it means actually they could better protect themselves because they're gonna fight no matter what, whether you give it or not. It's just the question of like, how are they gonna do it? With what, what speed they're gonna be like helping, so. Um, that's a lot for me to take in. I just don't know how to respond to what you just said. Um, the fact that you're so fearless um, that you know that your name out there is probably on the Russians list because you are an activist and you are heroic in what you do in the works that you're doing and you're using your English and your your multi-language your, your, your bilingual just to speak to people and communicate with the world what you just said does the fact that you could die because of this does that does that scare you or does that make you what do you what do you think about that? Because to me, as somebody that loves you, that's hard for me to stomach to hear you say stuff like that. Um, I think the close. I mean, like, uh, yeah, the the moment when I um when I experience this like fear of dying or actually concept of like you thinking about your own death was on February twenty fourth, because you didn't know how it's gonna go. You didn't know how you're gonna like, die, whether it's gonna be bombings or something, like so many like other ways. Um, and that was the first moment when I kind of like had to face like your own kind of like realization, like, oh, you might die because there is a war in your country. Um, I don't have it with me like day to day. Like I like I don't like few people have told me like, oh, you you know that like you need to be careful because of like Russia and like you was like an activist and you were like, giving these interviews being like pretty public. Somehow like I don't really care about that. Um, and yeah, like I would still do it. Like no matter if you tell me or not, like, like I, I would still continue doing what I'm doing, like speaking about Ukraine and like doing my job. So it doesn't really like matter for me. Um, on a large scale of things, like especially right now that I'm like relatively safer because I'm I'm further from the front lines and you know my loved ones are okay. Like I think that's like very important for me. Uh, but yeah, obviously, I do think of so like think of scenarios of like, sh what should I do if I do somehow happen to be in a territory that is occupied and where like Russians are around me like that's something unfortunate that I do have to think of and how to protect myself in those situations and kind of come up with plans like I, I don't foresee it realistically being the truth in the nearest future um the more weapons the world gives us <laughs> the less likely it's going to be the truth um but it is something that I still have to foresee like at the same level on the same level as like for example my family and I uh, we, we live close to Kiev and we know that they might attempt to take the city again if they see some sort of point of weakness again if Ukraine doesn't have enough resources which is would be that point of weakness they might attempt to take it again and um, we already discussing how do we act then like how my family can evacuate uh, now that they've seen what Russia can do and how I'm trying to convince my grandparents that like yes their house might be okay or like bombed or something but it's important that they stay alive um, and it is a really difficult conversation and like just concept of realizing that you can lose your home at any moment or day is actually scarier for me than even like death for some reason that's something that I think about more yeah I wish I knew what to say to all that because I, like you said, I'm an American. I've never been in a situation like that before. Um, a lot of this is a learning experience and 
learning about what you are going because to me this is ground zero for a lot of people who just watch tv and see the commercials and stuff like that this is ground zero uh this is someone who is actually uh in the in the city of kiev right now seeing it firsthand uh julia tamashenko we're gonna have a little bit more with her on the other side of the break make sure you stay tuned to the straight show podcast I think straight up means to be able to speak in a way that is straight up, to be honest and to speak your truth. Raw, uncut, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's blunt, you know, straight to the point, this what it is. It's just a place to be open and honest. And that's what I appreciate most about it. And it provides a place for community members to come together and just be straight up with each other about things that are going on in the world because it affects all of us. Uh, unfiltered, raw, with all the cursing that Calvin does. Straight up is just being real, telling it, telling it like it is, you know, um, being you. Being solid, being who you are, no matter what it is, no matter what situation you're faced with, right? This is who you are. It really, it really speaks to me saying it is what it is and it ain't what it ain't, straight up. I'm Sultan Salahuddin from Southside 62 Out right now. Make sure you tune in to the Straight Up Show podcast because that's where it's happening. You dig? Welcome back to the Straight Up Show podcast. I'm your host, Calvin. I uh, joined up today with a special guest of mine, my sister. Uh, she is familiar. She's my family. Uh, Julia Temeshiko, she is talking to us right now uh, from Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, thank you, Julia, so much for, first off, telling me that you're safe and sound and come on a podcast today. Julia, you know, you've been talking to us about what you've been seeing and everything like that and uh, what's going on. Um, let me ask you a question. What do you, what do you want this to end like? What's your idea of an appropriate and peaceful ending to all of this? What do you think can happen and what will happen, you think? A lot of people like wish for peace when they talk about this. All of those people are not from Ukraine. <laughs> um, because you need to, you have to wish for Ukrainian victory, um, which is very different for peace. When you, when you wish peace, um, we don't, we're not actually sure whether you support Ukraine or not. Because for someone, peace can mean Russia taking like half of Ukraine or taking whatever it has and then stops for some time, you know, fighting. But as I explained right now, that peace under Russia is literally worse than, you know, war for a lot of people. Um, you can't wish for that. You need to wish for Ukraine's full liberation and um, returning back to its legal um, internationally recognized borders that include Crimea as well and uh, areas on both Donbass and Luhansk um, because only that will ensure that Russia will not try to do something like that again. Well, I wouldn't say like ensure 100%, they may still try to do something again, but at least that will really show that if they try to do it, they might fail completely and then return to like, you know, where they started um so wishing for peace is not enough you have to wish for ukraine's victory um because ukraine will truly do everything to rebuild our country i mean you've seen how much our people are doing fighting they're gonna do the same for like rebuilding and like bringing back life to the cities that have been completely been erased to the ground because there are many of those um it's it's difficult for me obviously to like think about like the timeline when what this will end i'm kind of like preparing myself that this might take like years this might take like very long time um and it is really difficult and we already have to think about how we're gonna make the world not to like, get used to it and not to forget and not normalize all that the war in Ukraine is just like, a normal thing that's going on like no it's not. Um, so it is this still like scary to uh, 
sorry i'm yawning because it's already like almost yeah no so it's late sorry um (laughs) yeah uh but i'm hoping obviously that it's gonna end sooner than later um and it's gonna end yeah with ukraine's victory and restoration of its international recognized borders yeah do you think that eliminating putin would be the the best solution or no eliminating putin is not solving the problem the problem is not him the problem is a russian society which is thinks that they which is still having that colonial mindset it's like you can have different kings it's still the same colony i mean it's it's still the same kind of like colonizer the country that still colonizes like i don't know you can you can have people who change each other um i don't think it's going to change the fact that um a huge part of the society just they might not support like militaristic efforts but they still support the fact that like russia should culturally politically dominate countries like ukraine and others which is something that then leads to militaristic efforts as we've seen so like obviously i would be really happy to see putin killed preferably tortured um one day um like the day he dies is going to be just like such an insane celebration around the world like it's going to be beautiful um it doesn't solve the problem putin is a symptom he's not a root cause uh because my great grandparents didn't suffer from, from putin as you noticed um there was somebody else be- before him which means that somebody else can come after him um and ukrainians are ready for that they're ready to fight as long as it takes um they're not they're never ready to accept it and give up um so yeah i guess that answers your question like here in america a lot of ignorant like uh way of thinking that was in the past our generation is slowly turning the curve right and kind of being more i guess in a way more understanding of culture and in understanding of people or who they are do you think that our generation of russians that they can change that mentality of the colonization and things that they were brought up with because i know that From my understanding, a lot of Russians are kind of somewhat brainwashed and they are blocked out to what the world is. Like you said, they were running ads to show people what was going on in the real world. Do you think that the Russian, like I saw that Russians had the McDonald's clothes and they were all kind of pissed off about it. But do you think that slowly our generation, uh, people in Russia, they can see that uh, that's not how the world should work? You think that that day can never come, that it can actually build up to that or? that mindset of taking over and colonizing will forever be there? I don't, unfortunately, I want to hope for that. I didn't believe that Uh, because the Russians that I met that were very progressive, very smart, obviously had critical thinking in my university. It's such a few, like, it's it's like very, I don't know, like it's 1% of them. It's, It's such a small percentage of them that actually does that, that denounces not only Putin, but also Russian colonialism and Russian imperial ambitions that can critically look at their own history and culture and say, okay, this is wrong because this is erases indigenous populations in and their cultures and sort of puts Russia on the pedestal and makes it seem like this, I don't know, the greatest power in Eastern Europe where in fact, all the greatest thing they've done were like the greatest wars and genocides and just um, complete atrocities. So um, it's such a small percentage, unfortunately, of people that are able to do that. I don't say that they don't exist. And unfortunately, I feel like because it's such a small percentage that those people either leave Russia or they just like silently isolated in their own you know, circle. Um, and they don't believe that they can actually change something because um, on the first day of the war, what, like a few thousand of people came out on the streets of Moscow and everybody's like, oh, suddenly they woke up. And then what happened? You don't see protests anymore. Nothing's happening. Like, I'm not saying like, obviously I can't also say how much it's 
you know, how is it to live in Russia? And you know, obviously there's prosecution and stuff, and it's sort of really scary to like speak out. But we in Ukraine in 2014, we also, we threw off a dictator, a guy who was about to become a dictator. Um, we were fighting because like, again, as you see right now, everybody united. When if everybody unites, you're gonna be ultimately way stronger than the regime that is trying to oppress you and is trying to like command you. So it's always possible to overthrow this like oppressive government. It just like needs incredible unity and not like a small minority of people who are ready to do this or think that it's the right thing to do. Um, unfortunately, I don't see that in Russia. It's not in like a small minority. It's like almost like non-existent percentage of people. Um, so I don't know, like it's it's difficult to hope for that. I just don't. And to be honest, like as a Ukrainian, I don't care what they do in their own country. Like I don't care if Russia falls apart, if Russia becomes North Korea, like isolated and just like nobody hears about them. Uh, I don't wanna think. Like some people say like, oh, Ukrainians should like, you know, support Russian liberals who are like against Putin. Like they don't support Ukraine. Like even Russian liberals, they're not like, they, they might be against the war, but they're not against Russian colonial and imperial ambitions. They think, they say things like this, like, oh, when the war ends, all Russian elites and smart people are going to come to Kiev and make Kiev like a center of progressive russians yeah I heard and don't, that. they don't yeah. even see a problem with that yeah. statement yeah i heard that and like they don't even like like they don't even realize this the same colonial mindset like like the, the same kind of thing that like, your dictator that you're like against like dictates and yeah and that's just like incredibly frustrating to me so whatever they do in their country i don't yeah i like all I'm focusing on building a very is, is on building very strong Ukraine um, that can withstand that. So, like, what kind of I guess makes me mad is that people, and this is why I hate social media a lot. But um, people jump on trends a lot, and you know, like the whole like free Britney and all that stuff. They get up behind the you know, even with this that what's going on with Ukraine, people change their their profile pictures and stuff like that but two months or a month behind they just kind of like they, they forget about it um that really bugs me because i guess because i know you personally but for those who really want to help you and help the country of ukraine like what advice can you give them how they can help and why uh helping is going to definitely impact in the long run or just keeping ukraine i guess in in high energy and the country's name out there like what can people do to do better or what could they do differently well there are lots of things you can do which everybody can do no matter how much you're financially capable or how much mental energy you actually have to spend on some very big tragedy that is not even yours because I understand that people get tired. I would be tired to, to like hear just like horrific news. I am tired sitting in Ukraine. The only option, the only difference is that I don't have the option to just switch it off and forget. I think that's the only difference. Um, and kind of like the first tier, like the top thing you can do obviously is to donate to Ukrainian military causes. And by military, I don't mean like, oh my gosh, like if it's like against your morals, I don't want to like buy like a gun. Like, no, you can donate to the military to buy like um, first aid kits. You can donate to Ukrainian military for buying a truck. Like for example, I was running a fundraiser for like a truck for somebody who's in the Ukrainian armed forces who's a friend of my dad. Um, you can donate to buy like, I don't know, sleeping bags and tents because those are needed by the soldiers. There are so many things. And to be honest, like if you buy, like if you spend the money like for like one sleeping bag, like it's not gonna change your life much, but it's gonna change a lot of, you know, like the situation of Ukrainian soldiers who are literally sleeping right now in trenches as I'm falling asleep in my apartment in Kiev and I'm always gonna be grateful to them. Um, 
So that's when you, if you have resources, if you're able to do that, um, doing it on some sort of regular basis, even if it's like one or two dollars, like people are really underestimating the power of like one or two dollars. If like thousands or like 2,000, 10,000 people send like one or two dollars, that's already a huge amount of money. And I've been seeing that with my own fundraisers. Like I get, because it's just so many people donate like a very small amount of money. It's like within a day, I have like around $5,000, which is like an insane amount of money for Ukraine. Um, so don't underestimate how much like even like the smallest donation can make a difference. And you can be creative with that. There are so many initiatives in Ukraine. You can literally just like pick and choose and see in which one sounds like something that you want to contribute personally. The second one is like, obviously it might be very tiring for you to like read. Like I want to always say like stay informed and stay educated. Again, you have your own problems. It's hard for mental health. Like I understand that. Then you can support Ukraine on the cultural front, which doesn't require for you to spend your mental energy and you know to get all of those terrible news and get you know sad and just um, emotionally drained. You can uh, read Ukrainian literature, just like find it maybe like online or like books or something. You can learn basic Ukrainian lang like language phrases on like Duolingo. You can um, get familiar with like Ukrainian cuisine or like, you know, get like a Ukrainian flag and put it in your house. And you know why it's important? Because then, then when you do that, you also like educate people around you because you're going to be telling your friends like, oh, I'm learning this like new thing. Let me tell you this about Ukraine. So like information spreads. So then a person like me who came in 2015 to Louisiana and when I would say like, oh, I'm from Ukraine, from Kiev, and people were like, oh, Moscow, Russia, cool. I know this fun fact about Russia. And I'm like, did I say anything? Did I ask? If I, like literally every time I was, I was speaking about my country, the response I got like, oh, you're from Ukraine? One, one time I took the trip with my wife to Siberia on the train and we really liked it. We like really enjoyed our vacation in St. Petersburg. And I'm like, I'm happy you had a great time there. What does it have to be with me being Ukrainian? And that because ties back because people don't differentiate. They don't see the mm. difference. They don't educate themselves. They don't even like care. But by you making an effort to actually learn something specific about Ukraine, next time maybe somebody, whether it be like Ukrainian refugee or like a person who had to leave Ukraine for like many other reasons who comes to US, and comes to a random person and like let's say Starbucks and say that they're from Ukraine, they're like, oh my gosh, like it's amazing. My friend is learning Ukrainian on Duolingo, or like, oh my gosh, like I have a Ukrainian flag in my house, uh, or like I know this like one Ukrainian poet that I liked because like I read it. This is this makes us so seen and welcomed, and just it breaks that circle of us being and many other. Eastern European countries just not being like inseparable from Russia in the minds of Americans and other people. So this is something that doesn't require any money, doesn't require much of like mental resources. It's like it's actually can be really fun and educating and cool to do. So why not? Yeah. And everywhere I go, I make sure that I brag about you and <laughs> all this stuff is going on and. Like I had some friends that said that we shouldn't care about it. You know, it's not our business. And I'm like, no, this is what it is. And like, until this day, I still have friends that ask me about me reposting something. They ask me, how is your, your sister doing? Like, something she's, she's doing good, you know? So it, like, I brag about you wherever I go, because, you know, first off, I love you. Uh, and like, just to see you grow up to where you are now makes me very proud. I'm not going to keep you too much longer, but um, if, I'm very proud of the woman you've become. Uh, to see you use your voice, my girl's official now. My girl has a blue check mark. Like, you oh, know, this is just to see you like going on these different platforms, being fearless and telling your story. You really were a voice uh, for your country, and I want to encourage you uh, to keep being that voice because you know we meet, we need more people straight up and like honest like you and to keep fighting for what you believe in and that gives your country hope and i think that you doing that displays the bravery the courage 
and the willingness to keep something there hold to you to other countries like in America. They may not see it ignorantly, but I see it and I'm pretty sure that other people see it. Um, before you go, uh, how can people reach you on social media and maybe kind of hear more stories about and see at a ground zero level what you've been going through throughout this whole thing? Well, you can always find me on Instagram. That's my biggest platform. Um, I don't know if you can pull on the screen how like my... Yeah, I'll put a ticker uh, down. I'll put a ticker down. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can always find me on Instagram. Uh, that's where I talk the most and where I'm most active. I'm also on Twitter. Um, and I also try to like repost other like really Ukrainian voices and other very active Ukrainians. Um, that are talking about um, our country. And I also, um, am I on any other platforms? No, I don't have like SoundCloud. SoundCloud. <laughs> like my single hasn't came out yet. Um, so yeah, I think like Instagram and uh, Twitter are the biggest channels for me. And there's lots of information you can find there. All right. Well, Julia, I love you so much. Uh, if you need anything, somewhere to escape, to come here, you know your family is here. Please tell your mom that I love her too. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, Julia Timoshenko of Ukraine, keep fighting, keep being brave, keep keep keep, keep being courageous out there, and keep giving the word out. Because as long as that I have this platform, we will stand with Ukraine. Thank you so much. It means a lot, Calvin. Thank you. Well, you take care. And thank you once again for coming on our show. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right. That's a wrap for our show, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, you can reach all our, our previous episodes with Julia. Uh, go to our website at straightupshowpodcast.318. Sorry, straightupshowpodcast.com. That's straightupshowpodcast.com. Go to our website uh, and join the conversation and stand with Ukraine with us because it's not just one voice. It's all of us. It affects them. It affects all of us, whether you want to believe it or not. But make sure you join the conversation. Go to our website at straightupshowpodcast.com. Until then, there's only one rule to our show. You got to be straight up. See you later.